Hi everyone, this is Stephen Dempsey. Today I wanted to show you my quick start to finish process for creating a dynamic black and white image. While everything here I do is appropriate to this particular image, it's not going to work for everything. If there's one takeaway in this tutorial, it's that there's no such thing as a one-size-fits-all method when it comes to any kind of image processing. The more you build up your knowledge of On One Photo Raw, the wider your approach to different kinds of imagery. Let's take a look at this abandoned car I shot in Arizona. While it's pretty compelling as a color photograph, I prefer stripping it down to monochrome because what's most important to me is the texture, not the color. I actually think the colors change the mood completely, so I shot it with black and white in mind. There are different parts to this image that I want to work on separately. The clouds, for instance, are not going to need the same treatment as the car, and parts of the car itself will need a little more attention than others. This is what I mean about there not being a one-size-fits-all process. I've said this in other tutorials, but it bears repeating. In order to get the most out of On One Photo Raw, you'll need to have at least a fundamental understanding of masking. When you do, it'll unlock the full potential of your images. This is a simple but perfect example, so let's dig in. So in the interest of time, um, I have uh, the effects that I'm going to be stacking in this photograph to complete the black and white look already prepared. Um, because I want to try to get through this fairly quickly so I can talk about some more um, important uh, points. So we're going to go straight into effects. And you can see um, the different uh, layers that I'm going to be adding here. So the first thing that we're going to do is uh, obviously add the black and white filter because that's what we want to finish with is a black and white look. So just a quick discussion here, if you're not familiar with what these, um, these color sliders are. I mean, why do you have color sliders when it's a black and white image? Well, the red, the yellow, the green, aqua, blue, and magenta um, represent all of the colors that were in the original image. Some are there, are present in that particular image, some are not. Um, but each of these uh, color sliders gets assigned their own tonal value of gray. So that means that I can uh, darken or lighten um, those c colors from the original image um, in their grayscale equivalents. And so what I mean by that is, um, let me just show you. So in the blue, obviously in the sky here, um, this is like a, a lightness darkness control. So it, it gives me the full brightness of the blue. When I go all the way to the right, and there's a little bit of aqua in the sky as well, so you can see that um, all the drama is, is really gone and the contrast is gone between the clouds and the blue. So uh, in where there's blue skies in black and white images, particularly when there's white clouds, I like to be able to separate them by making the, uh, the sky itself um, fairly dark. Not black. I've seen black in certain photographs and that to me just starts taking away the sense of, of it being fairly realistic. Um, and that's a fine artistic choice, it's just not mine for this kind of image. So I'm basically going to darken the blue all the way down. And you can see already there's a nice contrast there with the clouds. And I'm also going to do the same with the aqua because I said, uh, as I said, there's aqua in that as well. So that gives it kind of a nice separation there between the blues and the whites. And there is no green in this Im image to speak of. Um, so. Uh, changing the slider won't do anything because it's not uh, a, a color that was in the original image. And magenta, the same thing. There's not really anything there. So um, the uh, the main colors actually are the blue of the sky and then the, um, the car and the sand uh, both have uh, elements of red and yellow in them. And so um, I have it cranked up right now with the yellow up to 90. If I was to bring that down, which is basically darkening... Um, the yellow in the original image. Uh, it's not where I want to go because it's beginning to lose a lot of the uh, detail that you can see. So I want to keep it up here to about 90 or so, up there 90. And then red, um, the same thing. If I start bringing that down, you can see parts of the, the scent and the rust in the car and all that kind of stuff uh, start getting darker. And I'm just going to actually crank that up to 100. So, you know, your mileage will vary based on the image that you're working with. And it's always kind of exciting for me to start with this, the black and white sliders because depending on the image and the colors that are in the image, um, these uh, sliders will have different 
effects like at different levels of effect i mean there, there might be an image with a lot of green in it um, and when you manipulate that it changes that dramatically but just not in this image so um, on an image by image basis uh, the sliders um, are, are are used differently there's again there is not a formula for good black and white um, because it really is dependent on the original colors in the in, in the original image Okay, so I'm pretty happy with that. And the next thing I want to do is I want to use a dynamic contrast filter. And what I want to do is I want to just like enhance the uh, texture in the car, bring out the kind of rust look. Um, but I do not, and, and I don't mind actually bringing out the detail and the grains of sand as well. But I don't want to apply dynamic contrast to the sky. In fact, um, as a general rule, I tend to avoid that at all costs because that starts. Uh, you know, you start losing the, the natural look of clouds um, where they have this kind of uh, graduated, like a softness to, to the edge of them. And that's the way they are in real life, obviously. So the more you start adding as far as sharpness or dynamic contrast, the, the, um, the sharper they get at the edges and they start losing their uh, natural look. So I really just don't add any kind of sharpness or anything to clouds. So uh, in order to do that, then we have to use masks and so I've uh, opening up this, you can see that I've already applied a mask. Um, let's just take a look at it if you're if it's not really obvious here. Uh, if I view the mask, you can see and this is just a this has kind of got a little messy here. But in general, I use the perfect brush to kind of paint around the the shape of the roof of the car, and then uh, all of this white the area down here means that the effect is going to be applied at 100% in the sand. Where you see black in the mask, that means that there's going to be no effect. It's completely transparent. So in this case, that means the sky. So um, if I go back to the to, uh, image view, uh, you can see that if I turn this on and off, it it's just really it's affecting the um, the foreground uh, with the car and also the just the sand, all of that stuff, but not the clouds. So, um, also what I wanted to do was I wanted to bring up a little bit of the shadow um, detail in the car and the shadow and stuff like that and, and it didn't really matter about the sand either way. So I'm going to, I just use the same mask and if I go back to the dynamic contrast and go down to the mask, you do that, whoops, sorry, you do that by hitting copy and when you copy that, that means that the mask that you've created, you can apply it to other effects. So that's exactly what I did with the tone enhancer. Um, I, uh, so I copied it, I should say I pasted it into the, this new tone enhancer. And if I turn it on and off, you can see that it's just applying the effect to the lower part of the image, um, and the car, but not affecting the clouds again. I, I didn't want to, uh, to lighten the clouds after I kind of got that little bit of drama going there. And speaking of the clouds, I wanted to make them a little bit darker. So instead of having to redo the whole mask again, what I did was I still had it copied and so I added the tone enhancer here and if we go to the mask, I first of all I pasted the mask and then I inverted it and what does that mean? So if we view it you can see that um, now the white is at the top meaning that uh, whatever the effect is it's going to just uh, be applied to the top because it's 100% white in this case and then it gradates down to black and anywhere there's black it's not a f uh, the image or excuse me the um, the effect is not applied to that so that's exactly what I wanted because I wanted to darken the sky a little bit more but not affect the foreground and the car so if we go back to the image view again and if I turn around and off you can see it's just pretty subtle okay so the next thing I wanted to do was I wanted to again bring up some shadow detail in this back wheel in the front wheel and then a little less just you know put the effect in a little bit on the bumper so i can bring up a tiny bit of the shadow detail on the same down here with this muffler so this was applied about 100 percent on the wheels and about 50 percent on uh, the bumper and the muffler so let's take a look at that and you can see that it, it has actually a fairly dramatic uh, effect on that back wheel if i turn around and off and then you can see what the mask looks like and it's just a it's a pretty sloppy mask, but it, it does the job here. So you can see 100% of the effect uh, with that pure white on the wheels. And then that kind of middle gray uh, means uh, that's on the bumper and the muffler down here. Uh, that means that it's not quite, uh, it's about, you know, it's about 50% um, the intensity. 
So I'll go back to the view again. And uh, again, on and off. And it's just the shadow detail. And then finally, um, for black and white images, my personal preference is I like to be able to add a little bit of warmth to um, the black and white. Um, I don't like the kind of default look. Um, so I do that by adding another black and white filter. And I'll use the toner. So everything up here stays the same. You don't have to mess with the sliders. If I go down to the, to the toner, I use the antique yellow, which is my favorite. So I choose that, and then I just leave the default or whatever way it, it applies. And I control the intensity um, by the opacity of that filter. So t about 26 works for this image for me. If I was to crank it up to 100, that would not look good at all. And then anything less, and you don't really see the difference. So I just like to usually have it around 25%. But again, it depends on the image. Um, some, sometimes you need to crank it up a little bit more, some, sometimes a little less. It just depends. So then finally, um, I added a vignette just to kind of focus the attention on the car and just bring things down a little bit on the edges. And I made sure that the car was in the center of the vignette, meaning that that would not be, the vignette would not affect it. So usually, if it's, let's say I, I applied it right in the center here, the vignette would probably come in a little bit and affect the front of the car. So I wanted to make the center of the vignette around the car so that um, everything else was kind of affected. And I do that by clicking on this little icon here that centers the vignette. And you can keep your finger down on the mouse or keep your thumb on the mouse, whatever it is. And uh, you can move it around to where you want it to, to land as the center point. And about there is good for this. So as you can see, I didn't globally apply the various effects of the image. I selectively applied the dynamic contrast and the tone enhancers. It's important to avoid sharpening clouds too much because they lose their natural look. And I was able to accomplish this by masking them out and only applying the effects to the car and the foreground. When you bring an image into effects, try to break it down into zones that need different treatment. Although you're looking at things on a local level, don't forget to see how they are impacting the complete image. So if you're zoomed in uh, and you're looking at a, a small part of the image that you're, you're working on or you're just like uh, very focused in on the, uh, the mask and, and applying that effect, make sure that you always kind of zoom back out as it were um, and make sure that whatever you're applying is complementing the image and not making it a distracting element. If you go overboard on one part of the photo, it, it'll draw the viewer's eye to that effect and the image will fail as a result. If this happens, you can turn down the opacity of the effect or maybe try another idea entirely. Having said all of that, sometimes it's fine to apply an effect globally, but the more you become acquainted with On One's toolbox, the more informed you'll be about what to do. Now, usually um, I have a tip at the end of my videos, but in the interest of time, I was not able to do it today. So I'll get back with the next uh, tutorial that I post uh, to those tips. And uh, also speaking of the next tutorials, there's a new version of uh, On One Photo Raw being released at the end of June. It's 2018.5, and it has some really cool new features. And I'll be talking about those in upcoming tutorials. So that's it. I hope this has given you some ideas for your own work. If you have any questions, please leave a comment. If you like this tutorial, please hit the like button. Also consider subscribing if you like what I'm doing. Until next time, thanks for watching.